Welcome on this third Thursday in Advent to our Advent reflection or meditation. During this month and our scriptures, we hear the nativity story and lots of things about the second coming. Christmas itself wasn't celebrated by the church until about sometime in the 300s. And then Advent came along as a penitential time in about the 500s. Those things developed over time until they became like what we see today as our tradition. It was around about the Victorian time that Christmas started looking like the trees and the lights and the decorations and the gifts and the oranges and was more like what we have today. In Victorian time, there was also that beginning of the sense of maybe Christmas is getting off track and maybe Christmas needs to be more attentive to what Jesus is about. So it was very common to have stories that appeal to people's sentiment and morality in order to sway them more toward a more faithful kind of Christmas. There was a poet and author and preacher, pastor, a Presbyterian gentleman named Henry Van Dyke Jr. And he wrote sermons in the days when sermons were sermons. None of this holding a stopwatch up to Cheryl to make sure she doesn't go over 10 minutes. Those sermons were the length of a feature film. And one advent, one Christmas Eve actually, Henry Van Dyke read, preached the story that he said was given to him as a gift from the capital G giver. I came across that story in a tiny little book when I was a child and it was foreboding. It was in Victorian language and it hardly had any pictures at all. And it wasn't something I could make my way through. I grew to appreciate it as an adult. And after we moved here, I decided to on the wing, preach it at St. Stephen's P Pittsfield. Well, let me tell you that abridging an 88 page book on the wing does not make it a lot less than 45 minutes to preach. But they were patient and I am not going to do that to you today. I'm going to read to you a children's abridgment of Van Dyke's The Other Wise Man called The Greatest Gift. And we'll see what you think about what the greatest gift might be. In the days when Augustus Caesar ruled the Roman Empire and King Herod reigned in Jerusalem, there lived in the city of Ecbatana among the mountains of Persia, a man named Artaban. From the roof of his house, Artaban could look out over rising battlements of black and white, crimson and blue, red and silver, to the hill where the emperor's palace lived above the city on Ecbatana like a jewel. Around his house grew a wonderful garden filled with flowers and fruit trees, watered by rushing streams and made musical by countless birds. High above the tallest trees in the garden stood a tower, and from its window a lamp often shone late into the night, for it was here that Artaban worked. He was a follower of the faith of Zoroaster studying the eternal struggle between the forces of good and evil and exploring the secrets of nature, above all, the secrets of the night sky. Artaban had three friends, Caspar, 
Melchior, and Balthazar. And for all four men, knowledge of the stars was the highest form of learning. One spring night, the four companions were looking up at the sky when they observed two great planets drawn together in the sign of the fish and a new star shining more brightly than any they had ever seen. The men knew from their studies that this star signified the birth of a great teacher who was to be born among the Jews. There and then they decided to follow the star. They arranged to meet up together at a place far away by the temple of the seven spheres in ba Babylon. From there, they would set out with the caravan of supplies and follow the star to Jerusalem to pay homage to the child. Quickly, Artaban arranged his affairs. He would sell his beautiful house with its fragrant gardens, and he bought three jewels, a sapphire, a ruby, and a pearl to carry as a tribute to the newborn child. On the eve of his departure, he said farewell to his old father and knelt to receive his blessing. Before dawn, even before the first bird had awoken, Artaban went down to the stable where Vasta, his favorite horse, stood saddled and bridled in her stall, shaking her bit and pawing at the ground impatiently. He swung himself into the saddle and was soon riding swiftly westward. He had to reach the temple of the seven spheres on the appointed night and the journey was long and hard. Artaban knew Vazda's strength and pushed forward riding late into the night and starting long before sunrise every morning. Each evening, as soon as the sun sank behind the hills, the bright new star shone down upon them. Finally, after 10 days and 10 nights, he saw before him the great walls of Babylon. At last, in three hours time, he would be at the temple of the seven spheres. As they trotted past a grove of date palms outside the city walls, Vasta started. She lowered her head and gave a soft whinny, then stood stock still, quivering in every muscle before a dark object lying in the shadows. Araban dismounted. In the dim starlight, he could see the figure of a man lying across the road. He leaned down to touch the man's head. The man gave a ghostly sigh and clutched at his robes with long bony fingers. Artaban's heart leapt to his throat. The man needed help, but how could he stop tonight of all nights? God of truth and purity, Artaban prayed, direct me in the holy path, the way of wisdom which you know better than any mortal. Then he fetched water, mixing it with some of the healing herbs which he always carried. He laid the sick man's head in the crook of his elbow and slowly poured the liquid into his parched mouth. Hour after hour he poured, a little at a time, then waited and poured again. At last the sick man's strength returned. Who are you? he asked, and why have you brought back my life? I am Artaban of the city of Ekbatana, and I'm going to Jerusalem in search of one who is to be born king of the Jews. I dare not stay with you any longer, for the caravan that has been waiting for me may depart without me. But see, here is all that I have left of bread and wine, and here is a potion of healing herbs. The sick man raised his trembling hand solemnly to heaven. May the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob bless you and bring you peace. Now take heed, the Messiah will not be born in Jerusalem, but in Bethlehem of Judah. May the Lord bring you in safety to that place because you have had pity on me and saved my life. It was already past midnight. Artaban rode quickly across the silent plain but when he reached the temple of the seven spheres, he could find no trace of his friends. Then by the edge of a terrace, 
he saw a little cairn of bricks and under them a piece of parchment. He caught it and read, we can delay no longer. We go to find the king of kings. Artaban stared out across the desert. How can I reach Judah, he asked himself, with no food and a tired horse. I must return to Babylon, sell my sapphire, and buy camels and food for the journey. I may never catch up with my friends. Only God knows whether I shall miss the king of kings because I stopped to help a dying man. So Artaban returned to Babylon where he sold his glittering sapphire and his beloved horse Fasa in exchange for a caravan of camels. Then he set out across the dreary desert. Dark ledges of rock rose up around him like the bones of ancient monsters. Shifting hills of treacherous sand skirted his route. By day, a fierce heat blistered the earth so that no living thing could move. By night, jackals prowled and barked in the distance and an icy chill fell over the dunes. But he pressed on, faithfully following the bright new star until as the sick man had told him, it shone above the village of Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Artaban drew near the village full of hope. Now at last he could give his pearl and his ruby to the king. But the streets were deserted and he wondered whether the men had gone up to the hill pastures to bring down their sheep. Then from the open door of a stone cottage, he heard someone singing softly. He entered and found a young woman singing her baby to sleep. Yes, the woman told him, three strangers from the east had appeared a few days earlier. They had said that a star had guided them to the place where Joseph of Nazareth was lodging with his wife and her newborn son. And they had paid great reverence to the child and given him many gifts. But she went on, the travelers have disappeared again. And they say the man from Nazareth has fled to Egypt with his family. Now there seems to be a spell over the village. People even say the Roman soldiers are coming to enforce a new tax. And the men have driven our flocks and herds high up into the hill to escape it. Artaban listened to her gentle voice and the baby reached up to touch his face. Suddenly, there came a noise of wild confusion in the streets, a shrieking and wailing of women's voices, a clashing of swords and a desperate cry. The soldiers, the soldiers of Herod, they are killing our children. The young woman's face went white with terror. Clutching her baby to her breast, she crouched in the darkest corner, covering him with her robe. Artaban strode over to the doorway. The tip of his white cap almost touched the lintel. When the soldiers reached the cottage, Artaban summoned their captain and said, I am alone here and I will give you this jewel if you will leave me in peace. Then he showed the ruby glistening in his palm like a great drop of blood. The captain's eyes widened with greed and he grabbed the jewel. March on, he cried, and the soldiers left. Artaban turned to the east and prayed, God of truth, forgive my lie. I have said the thing that is not to save the life of a child. And now two of my gifts are gone. Shall I ever see the king of kings? But from the shadows behind him came the woman's voice saying, because you have saved my little one, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord give you peace now and always. So Artaban left with the woman's blessing and made his way to Egypt, asking everywhere for news of the family from Bethlehem. But he could find no trace of them. By now, the star had vanished from the night sky, 
and he had no idea where to continue his search. So he went to a wise old Hebrew rabbi to seek advice. My son, said the rabbi, our scriptures foretold that the king of kings would be despised and rejected by men. He will not be found in a place, nor among the rich and powerful. If you seek him, look among the poor and the lowly, the sorrowful and the sick. The years passed and Artaban traveled on, always searching in the poorest places for the family from Bethlehem. He passed through towns where people were crying with hunger. He passed through cities where they were dying of plague. And though he found no king of kings to worship, he found many to help. Wherever he went, he fed the hungry and clothed the naked he healed the sick and he visited those in prison and his years went by more swiftly than a weaver's shuttle that darts back and forth through the loom while the web grows and the invisible pattern is completed. From time to time, he would stop and take out his pearl, the last of his gifts. And as he gazed on it, he would wonder whether he would ever meet the king of kings. 33 years had passed since Artaban had first seen the star and set out on his journey. Now, worn and weary, he traveled to Jerusalem to make one final search. He arrived during the season of the Passover and the city was thronged with people who had come for the feast. But this year, there was a strange sense of foreboding in the air. All around Artaban, sandals clattered and thousands of bare feet shuffled over the stones as the crowds were swept along to the Damascus gate. What is happening? asked Artaban. Haven't you heard, replied a young man, there is going to be a crucifixion. Two robbers are to be crucified and another man called Jesus of Nazareth. They say he has said and done many wonderful things and everyone loves him greatly. But the priests and the elders say that he must be killed because he calls himself the son of God. Then Artaban knew that this must be the king of kings for whom he had been searching all these years. His heart thumped and his mind raced. Perhaps if he offered his thing Phil Earl to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, he might save the man's life. He hurried towards the Damascus gate, but just beyond the entrance to the guardhouse, a troop of soldiers came down the street, dragging a young girl with a torn dress and disheveled hair. As Artaban paused to look at her, she broke away from the hands of her tormentors and threw herself at his feet. Have pity on me, she cried. Save me. My father was a follower of Zoroaster, and I see from your dress that you are of the same faith. Now my father is dead, and I am to be sold as his slave to pay for his debts. Help me, please. Artaban looked on the girl and trembled. For a third time, he had to choose between keeping his jewel as a gift for the king of kings or surrendering it to save a fellow human being. Yet he knew that to rescue this helpless girl would be a true deed of love. Artaban took his priceless pearl from its pouch and placed it in the girl's hand. Here is your ransom daughter. It is the last of the treasures I was keeping for the king of kings who is now to be crucified. As he spoke, the sky grew black and tremors ran through the street, which heaved like someone in pain. Houses rocked, stones fell and crashed into the street. Dust clouds filled the air. The soldiers fled in terror, reeling like drunken men, and Artaban and the girl took refuge beside the wall of the guardhouse. 
the earth gave one final shudder and a heavy tile loosened from the roof fell and struck Artaban on the temple. As the girl bent over him, fearing that the old man was dead, there came a voice through the darkness, very small and still, like music sounding from a distance. The voice said, Peace be with you, Artaban. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in distress, you comforted me. As often as you did these things, to the least of my children, you did them for me. A calm radiance lit up the face of Artaban and a long last sigh of relief left his lips. His journey was ended. At last, he had found the king. This gift of Henry Van Dyke to the ages was not the only gift he gave us to remember what our hope in Jesus should be and what true homage to Jesus the best, not giving valuable things simply for their monetary value, but to bring the love and healing and hope in the name of the King to all those who would turn to him for salvation. Henry Van Dyke wrote a most beloved hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Let us close remembering that we adore and serve the Jesus who grew from the youngest babe to the man on the cross for our redemption. Yes. Yeah.